I think one of the key highlights when, you, when you're starting out the company is obviously the, the team. It's great. So if you can create some masterclass on fundraising, I think... That would save two years of time. Our first one was 600 million. So you know, instead of trying to understand, okay, what are the treatment in the clinic, we just buy uh, three, four clinics, we rebrand them and we started from scratch. Unfortunately, you know, we are always with the mindset. And so basically after starting as a standard investment venture capital firm, we realized that, you know, we wanted to be more close to our investments and to our investors. And once we're actually be ready to get one of two clients to those companies, we're going to those companies and then look guys, now we have two clients. Do you allow us to invest basically in your business? And you know, we will be your representative in Europe. So our venture studio experience really came from working across those portfolio companies, trying to bring them clients and realizing, wait a second, actually, you know, this is, we can replicate this solution in this market in Europe by creating a new company. What we always do and, and rely on is heavy market research for the first sort of two to three months to understand the viability of, of the underlying company. And you know, when you're going to the late stage approach, you are really, you know, even if you put $50 million in a $2 million company, you have 2%. So you have zero voting rights, zero minority rights. You are no one, you know, they don't even answer your phone and you put $50 million. Robin, Fiorenza, very happy to meet you on my podcast. Uh, please, can you share your story of uh, Lian Group, uh, how it started, when, and what is your progress for the last several years? Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you, Max. Max, uh, thank you much, Max, for having us. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity today to share our experience. So basically, I co founded Lian in 2017. Lian today is a pan European investment firm slash venture studio, which is at, at offices in five different countries with more than 50 employees uh, across Europe uh, and the Middle East. We specialize obviously in tech, but you know, we see a lot that we focus a lot about also built out companies uh, and venture studio building. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm very excited today with Robin. Uh, that you know joined this pretty uh, in the early days of the company to to share my view. Indeed, yeah. Me me personally been working alongside Ferenza and across various sort of operational roles in uh, in in some of the kind of venture studio companies, but also been heavily uh, involved in the broader investment team. So uh, so yeah, happy to be here and. Uh, Uh, how many companies have you created uh, for this six years? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the story is pretty interesting. We started as a traditional, let's say, venture capital investment firm. And basically, I would say, was the key takeaway from that is that, you know, in a certain way, you are very far from the operation. You, you know, when you are an investor, you, you know, having your quarterly calls with the founders, but, you know, at the end of the day, you are missing a lot of details. You are missing, you know, really what's happening there in the company which actually also created a lot of issue with your LPs because, you know, most of the time they are asking some technicalities about the business, but, you know, as you are not involved in those operations, you struggle with questions. And so basically after starting as a standard investment venture capital firm, we realized that, you know, we wanted to be more close to our investments and to our investors. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to be the responsible, the direct responsible of our choices and our mistake. You know, we didn't want to be in a situation where actually an investor asking for a question, why did that happen? And we cannot provide the answer. Uh, so we transitioned actually in reality in 2020 with, you know, a majority of our focus today being the Venture Builder Studio. Uh, we already have five companies that which we will be out. We'll discuss all of that. But, you know, I think the key reason for this switch was, you know, our, let's say, lack of uh, operational involvement in those company, and we wanted to provide the investor the opportunity to have a real, real answer to the question. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. just, just to add and, and build quickly on, on Fiorenzo's point there, I think it's uh, Fiorenzo kind of nailed it in the, in the sense that, you know, we previously in, in sort of 2018 and moving onwards and invested in multiple Kind of tech companies are mostly nominated in, in you know US equities and so forth in the, in the more later stages um, and and kind of one of the key pillars and, and DNA of, of Leon group has been that you know we always want to be a sort of 
value provider in some sense from, from our side as well. I know that term has been kind of eroded a bit, uh, especially the, the value add, but we really kind of try to go beyond capital uh, in, in some cases and in actually majority of cases where we not just come with the pure capital, but also whether it's operational expertise, uh, helping the company scale. Uh, for example, if it's in Europe, because we are obviously you know, investing in U.S. equity. So I think that really reinforces the point of venture studio creation. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just want to understand, like, how many companies have you invested in just VC model? And then uh, you, you say that five, five companies you, you backed or co-created with entrepreneurs, right? When, when you started to, to build companies? Yeah, so just to be more precise, so, you know, we invested more or less across 20 tech businesses. Uh, let's say that has been the technology focus and, you know, our focus has been very involved on the late stage cycle of the companies. So Series D onwards, and usually with pretty solid tick ends, 20 to $50 million. So pretty concentrating companies. Basically, the idea is very simple, is that, you know, in order to, you know, at that time, especially in 2019, where the tech was very, very bullish, you know, it was very hard to, for a small fund, a European company like us, to get access to those tech investors and those tech companies. So we had to find a way to get us access to those deals. And, um, and basically what we realized that, you know, we're going to see those companies, those large U.S. unicorns, and telling them, we don't want to invest 20 million. We want to open the markets for you. We are not looking for money. You are backed already by, you know, all the top investors. So what you need is clients. You need to increase your RRR. You need to bring partners. And so we already kind of pre-started this venture building model from the fact that, you know, we created an internal team, which we were calling, you know, a kind of a company's portfolio engagement team, where actually those people were looking only for clients for those companies. So they were calling companies in Europe, hey, we're representing this U.S. company, a little bit like a distributor of technologies. And once we're actually be ready to get one of two clients to those companies, we're going to those companies and then, look, guys, now we have two clients. Do you, want, do, do you allow us to invest, basically, in your business? And, you know, we will be your representative in Europe. So, you know, you need... You need a business development team in Europe. We want to be your external business development. Um, so we have done this very successfully with a few companies in the portfolio. Uh, one which is very famous is a company called Bitfury, which you know was one of the early pioneers in the Bitcoin blockchain infrastructure space. And uh, and then you know let's say from this kind of business development activity, we realize okay you know let's build JV, let's create companies that with our portfolio companies. And in fact, the first company which we built out, you know, it's uh, started in 2020, uh, November 2020, was basically a, a kind of in a certain way spin off of Bifuri because, you know, we, we basically have uh, done a JV with them in Norway, where actually we bought one of their major data centers and we built out, you know, our first, let's say, Bitcoin mining operation. So, you know, like our first company that we created, which, which is called Koa, uh, and the vision was really to build, you know, the biggest European blockchain infrastructure provider for proof of work for the Bitcoin blockchain was kind of starting as, again, as a collaboration with an existing portfolio company. And then, you know, by this collaboration, you say, okay, you know, actually, this is not a JV. You can really build the business out of it. So our venture studio experience really came from working across those portfolio companies, trying to bring them clients and realizing, wait a second, actually, you know, this is, we can replicate this solution in this market in Europe by creating a new company. Uh, Robin, maybe you want to add some points to this. Yeah, I think, uh, again, Ferenzo nailed it before kind of, you know, jumping head first into the water on, on Cola and, you know, bringing it to, to where it is today, which is a, a big company on a global scale, one of the leaders in Europe. What we always do and, and rely on is heavy market research for the first sort of two to three months to understand the viability of, of the underlying company that, you know, we want to bring to the market. So. I think that is that has been a coherent line across all the all the companies we have sort of founded in the in the last couple of years. Um, that's what happened there. Uh, there was a very very sort of diligent process on on understanding the scale, on understanding the future viability. Uh, you know, heavily also relied on the financial understanding of the, of the underlying companies. So and you know that proved to sort of tick all the boxes, and that's where the decision came from. And you know. Um, I think we're glad we, we went this route. So. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah. Let me understand it. Uh, so you first you partner with some uh, 
unicorns or some big companies yeah. in the US. And you say that let's try us to create a subsidiary in, in Europe uh, and we will develop your, your business here. So it's like free, we'll, we'll just do it for, for free for you. Just yeah. test like how, how it goes. If it's great, you, you offer that let's launch a subsidiary of your huge companies together, uh, huge company together here in Europe and we will be investors. So we will invest money uh, in, in your subsidiary. You will be our partner. And uh, and then maybe you also will bring an entrepreneur who also gets shares in in these new companies. Is this uh, right? The, is this the model? Yeah, so this was let's say the the incipit, you know, the beginning of of the mm. story. But mm. then you know what we realized is that actually you know in reality those JV were kind of independent company in a certain way, and you know mm. like basically we realized that actually you know we ourselves were able directly. You kind of build those company without the portfolio company. Because, you know, when you're working very close, you're building a JV, you understand about the business, and you understand about the tech, then, you know, it's just a matter of, okay, you know, but actually, maybe I can build, you know, we can build our own companies, and actually, we don't need the tech anymore, you know, they can keep a distributor. So, you know, this is, you know, to come back. Today, just let me clarify, we have five companies that we built out, which are currently, let's say, the active yes. portfolio, obviously, you know, there are a few of them which we're going to discuss that eventually failed uh, as normal in the you know in the development and, and, and phase. So the first one is this company called Coa, uh, which again was in a certain way the spin-off or you know, let's say was the European operation of Bitfury, which we bought back and you know, which we established. So what we're doing with Coa today is that we're building literally the infrastructure for Bitcoin for the Bitcoin blockchain. So, you know, we are having those data centers uh, where we also, you know, we self-mine Bitcoin, part by renewable energy. And now, you know, we are transitioning a lot into the AI, let's say, compute space. So, you know, we're, we're focusing, and, and Robin will, list, will tell us more, but, you know, we are now building compute AI data centers. So it's a, it's a kind of a tech infrastructure business across two major commodities, the hash rate, which is obviously the Bitcoin blockchain commodity, and the AI compute. Um, so this company grew pretty fast. You know, we had done a 750 million late, late, latest valuation rounds, pretty solid EBITDA above $30 million. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Max. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, say, you said this company attracted external investment or, or not? Yeah, yeah uh -huh. for sure. The process is we, let's say, internally finance the first, let's say, one or two years, you know, let's say until C, if we can call it until Series A. And, you know, depending on the business model of the company, this might be a few million dollars, but, you know, might be for an infrastructure business, $20 million, you know. It really depends on which kind of the business model we're targeting. And then usually from Series A, we're looking to examine investors. So, you know, COA had this first Series A in uh, April 2022, uh, which was closed. Now, you know, we are just literally starting the Series B round. And, you know, again, this is majority of the capital is external capital. Uh, do you partner with entrepreneurs uh, and share equity with them? Or what is your business plan in terms of equity? How much equity your fund or studio takes? How do you um, uh, give to your founders? And maybe, like, what is uh, what, what equity then is for future rounds? What is, what is your plan for those companies? Yeah. So today the way it works is simple. Um, out of the five companies, four are being co-founded by myself and uh, my co-founder. Uh, so, you know, let's say the, the equity stays inside us because in a certain way we are the founders of this company. But obviously, you know, as the business scale, you realize that actually you cannot found 20 companies. You know, it's, it's impossible to be founder of 20 companies. Otherwise, you know, you, you basically go everywhere and do nothing. So, you know, let's say now we have one company with an external partner, or let's say an external founders, but our objective is, you know, obviously to move more towards the direction where we are having, you know, a series of number of companies which are coming from external partners that are leveraging our, our infrastructure, which is finance, operation, tech, legal. Uh, so, you know, those are the kind of, 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 of components for me. Yeah, I think uh, one of the key points here uh, to kind of, uh, shine some spotlight on this is the fact that when, when the company gets launched or whether it's external founder, it's within Lian, doesn't matter. 
We usually try to sort of appoint uh, uh, acting CEO for that business in the first six months in order to sort of take some burden off of uh, of the you know Leo Group founders or external founders because we we think it's a viable business model in order for them to run anonymously and and sort of report back on that side because otherwise you know you're managing a number of different companies and it's hard to to sort of have you know rationalized focus on on any of those companies and I think you know quickly falling back on the point as well that. You know, Lian usually brings the initial funding, whether it's sort of like 1.5 million uh, to 2 million uh, for the initial one to one and a half years in order to get the first employees going um, and, you know, get that momentum going there. And, you know, then hopefully it will become sort of a snowball effect. I think, you know, one of the points to, to you know, uh, again, emphasize on, on Fiorenzo's, what he mentioned before, um, is that you know when when you're a venture studio company and, and you're building up sort of a company in the in the venture studio space, then you have much more trial and error phases than your traditional VC backed uh, startup. That that goes back to the notion of you know you are doing it internally. As as I mentioned, uh, we do heavy market research. You know you know we try to understand the product market fit from the get go, um, and that really helps us to you know be sort of uh, efficient with the capital allocation as well as understanding the viability. So if, if, if sort of the business plan fails, we go back to the drawing board, try to work out what went wrong, if we should, you know, take a different angle and so forth. So I think in, in general, just to sum up on, on this point, venture studio model in terms of companies, much more flexible, uh, whether we're talking in terms of funding, in terms of power market fit, or in terms of, you know, simple business model viability. Um, so yeah. What are your criteria for business ideas you're trying to launch or validate? What do you check while deciding to, to create a company? Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> that's a really good question. But I would say, you know, like we are completely different, I guess, from, um, from you know, what, what I've seen in the, in, the, in the past. Because, you know, like, you know, our mindset here, it's a mindset based on creativity, you know, like um, I really believe, you know, that, you know, entrepreneurship in reality is just people which create something from nothing and, you know, people which have a very creative mindset. So, you know, here we're trying to be creative as much as possible, which basically means we're listening and, and looking at everything, you know, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, like crazy sector or crazy idea that we never thought, uh, you know, might represent the better opportunity. Uh, to give you an idea, for example, you know, with my co-founder, we found uh, a, a, a dental network of clinics uh, which are empowered by technology uh, into the dental space. And, you know, when he came to me uh, with that idea, I was like, you know, we're doing tech. Why you want to build a dental chain? You know, like, where is the tech, you know? And eventually, you know, this, this is one of the top portfolio companies that we built out and incubated with the fastest scale up to market, because, you know, effectively there is a huge need in the markets of digitalization for a dentist business. Um, but, you know, if you were asking, is a dentist a business uh, someone that goes inside your category, I would say absolutely not. So, you know, to answer to your question is that we are completely open. What we are looking is that, you know, obviously, you know, the most important thing is the entrepreneur. Um, we prefer entrepreneurs which are failed in the past uh, because, you know, they learn, and, you know, sometimes first-time entrepreneur, that this phase where actually in the beginning is so beautiful, everything is fantastic. And then, you know, the first things start to go bad and then, you know, they just lose because they, they don't have the energy enough and they need to continue. So, you know, we prefer people that, you know, already experienced some failure in the past, et cetera, et cetera, and they already know what's going on. But to answer your question, we don't have any blockage. We listen and look to everything. And, uh, and we're trying to really work together and understand, as Robin said, if, you know, that crazy idea might make sense. The question is, have you fundraised your first fund? Did you launch only one fund or several funds? And uh, what's the difference you see for maybe you fundraised for, for the venture builder or maybe just for VC? So do you see the difference in fundraising to just a typical VC fund? Late stage, if I understood right, and, yeah. uh, and uh, between fundraising for a studio. And like, t- tell about your funds. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's a, a very simple stuff. So, you know, like, I'll, I'll tell you exactly. Today, our venture studio business model 
is working basically on a, what we call a deal by deal approach. Uh, deal by deal approach meaning that you know we will incubate the company and then you know we go individually to see those investors say okay do you like this company I don't like this company do you like that company why is that you know the major advantage of that is that you know entrepreneur and investors they don't want to be stuck 12 years 10 years in the fund without knowing where to invest they actually love this due diligence process they want to ask questions they want to understand okay but why I want to learn more etc etc and during dinner, they want to speak with their friend. They want to say, look, I invest in this dental business. They don't want to say, I want I invest in a growth equity fund, you know. So for them, it's about experience, which, you know, today is obviously in our society the most important thing. So, you know, having, providing those entrepreneurs the experience to be able to invest in one company is definitely a big value up. The big problem of that is that, you know, sometimes you're in front of you two or 300 investors, and then you get two, 300 diligence. So, you know, the time required in the founder exit process is way, way, way more uh, lengthy. And, you know, I would say also uh, tiring for the teams because, you know, you have plenty of Q&A, then the investor relation process is harder because you have plenty of investors to manage. So you know, there is downside, but, you know, I think the excitement that we have when we're going to pitch individually for each company, it's way, way better than, you know, if you have just a venture fund studio and, you know, you need to deploy capital without, you know, uh, having that. So, you know, for the moment, we have uh, decided to have this entrepreneurial power platform where, you know, we want to give our entrepreneur or our partner the choice to choose whether they like this product or not, which makes a lot of sense. What, what about your first fund? Is fund? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> been a, a mix of, uh, you know, traditional uh, institutional investors, uh, you know, but uh, I'm, uh, let's say we are not a big believer of the found business model. We, we do not believe that, you know, I think especially on the, obviously on the tech, on the early stage, there are probably already 200 platforms in the markets. And, you know, like uh, it's very hard to reach the level that those guys have, you know, because, you know, you need a huge uh, fundraising team. You need, you know, it's very hard to differentiate yourself. So that's why I believe that, you know, with this approach of the club deal, deal by deal, it's way better because, you know, eventually, when you're reaching a success on an individual company, I think it's way, way, way more solid than, you know, if you have one company inside one fund that is averaged now with, you know, 20 others that are performing bad. And, you know, again, coming back to the experience, you know, our generation, millennials, they're looking for journey, they're looking for new discovery. Who's going to wait 10, 12 years in the funds? Uh, like we're seeing a trend where, you know, eventually the founder are opening more and more towards credit deal approach, co-investments, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to be absolutely focused on that trend. And again, I think Ferenzo, like that, that point on, especially on the equity story, that's what we really emphasize on and care about. I mean, it's not just the return and, and investment, it's more on the equity story and how your underlying, you know, investors are aligned to it as well as the team on, on creating something new. And I think just falling back quickly again on the on the fund structure, you know, over the past couple of years, years sort of, you know, from 2019, even 18, the, the push to scale in venture capital has eroded the product, uh, in my opinion, completely. The, the venture capital fund product. We, we saw going funds, you know, 1 billion funds being the kind of norm. And, you know, now we're seeing those being slashed. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, uh, and, and this is again my opinion, but, but venture capital cannot be scaled that heavily. It's a, it's a, it's a artesian craft that, you know, rewards, uh, specialization and, and focus. So, so that's, that's pretty much it. That's why we stick to our roots. I think being, you know, uh, sort of on this one, one, one to one relationship really, you know, brings out the difference, um, and, you know, scaling the company sufficiently. So, yeah. Still, like you started with a huge fund, right? So if you, if you like Series D, it's like five hundred plus million or not? Yeah, yeah. You switch to this uh, creation from scratch model. Do you think that its ability to to have higher returns when you you, you are building from scratch and when you actually buy this equity at the lowest price because you are creating it? Um, yeah. I think, you know, I've uh, had the chance to read many times your reports. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm inspiring my answer to from what I read from you. But, you know, like you spend so much time doing this research and comparing IRR. For sure, you know, like there is a, it's a no-brainer choice for, for, for an investor. Because, you know, at the end of the day, what we're building the value is really in the first six to 12 months of a business. And, you know, when you're going to the late stage approach, 
you are really, you know, even if you put $50 million in a $2 billion company, you have 2%. So you have zero voting rights, zero minority rights. You are no one, you know, they don't even answer your phone and you put $50 million. So if you invest those 50 million and you can build 10 companies, you know, I'm sure you're getting way, way, way more value than that 2% tickets in that company. From your story, from what you can learn from the capital deployed, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I mean, for us, it's, a, it's definitely a no-brainer problem. Yeah, I, I think that as well. You know, if you look at whether you fall back on like key data points, such as, you know, from seed on, on VC standpoint, you go anywhere from like, you know, 20% average sort of equity sold on, on seed stage and, and 10% on, on, on D stage and it kind of, you know, linearly falls down, then, you know, it's a huge difference, uh, comparing, uh, to, to your venture studio model. Cause you obviously retain more equity in the company. You, you have a more clear alignment, I think, within the investors and team as well, as, as you know, majority of the, of the team is in place. And I, I think that kind of falls back on whether it's motivation, it's, it's, or again, it's pure alignment. So, so I think uh, it's, it's a key point. Small correction that I didn't count the IRR. I just took data what was available. For the next year, we'll try to, uh, to do our own research on IRR of Finch. And I think there are some, all the data present now is a bit either biased or like has some draws or flaws in, in the methodology to count, to count. So like, this is why I think, uh, there should be some independent research done very properly, like with PhDs, uh, independent PhDs looking, looking at this process to, to, to make it really valuable for all the, uh, venture capital investors. Yeah. I want to ask about your value of the studio. So, of course, it's like capital, one, two million uh, to cover first uh, one and a half, two years costs. But maybe maybe you can explain why is it better than launching a company independently, for example, for entrepreneurs uh, joining, joining your studio. I understand that, uh, of course, capital, maybe you can... You can say, like, do you have some additional value? Why is it more effective to launch company with with your team than in in Wild? Yeah, so it's uh, I would say it's a plenty of answer to that question, but you know, it's I would say it come back to two points. Entrepreneurs need the in certain way psychologists, you know, like need someone that actually you know like. They, they, they can talk every day, I say, about what's going wrong, about share there's excitement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the role of myself and, uh, and my co-founder, when you know we're partnering with an external entrepreneur, is you know to have daily conversation and you know guiding, we you know what we believe is good, what we believe is bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, let's say they need to have a voice where actually they can exchange and you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you know what do they need? Is obviously they need the team to execute. So, you know, you can have plenty of ideas, but, you know, if you don't have an efficient team that we execute, it's, it's going nowhere. And the way we structure the company internally is that, you know, we're very processed in a way of function of people. So, for example, we'll have one person, which is a top tier guy in building business plan, building valuation, building Excel, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, this is his job and what he loves to do. Each person is allocated as a resource to the entrepreneur in the initial phase. So, you know, we also oblige in a certain way the entrepreneur to have a physical contact with us. So we try to tell him, look, you need to come to the office. We need to see you first to face, especially for the first six months. Try to at least a couple of times per, per week you come to the office. Why? Because, you know, we want the idea of connecting people with the team. We know with the other people, get to know each other as well. Building a team around this entrepreneur and then, you know, gradually allow him to recruit his own team as, as we grow. And, uh, and then, you know, I think one of the key benefits is that obviously being coming from the venture capital world, we have plenty of network of other VCs. So, you know, for us, it's very easy to raise capital after because, you know, those VCs are all co-investors. They're all, you know, being together with other deals. So, you know, we can help the entrepreneur basically to raise also the future round of funding. You know, we, myself and my founder, we sold already many companies. We have bought many companies. So when, you know, we can advise on M&A processes, acquisitions, you know, kind of more deep topics that, you know, might be relevant for the future. And especially, you know, when there is a VC coming on the table to negotiate the term sheet, you know, immediately we know where, you know, that liquidity preference is going to hurt us, uh, whether, you know, this, this thing is very bad for the entrepreneur. And, you know, 
I realized many of the time that the entrepreneurs lack, lack those skills, the venture capital skills. So they don't know how to negotiate the term, they don't know some terminology, they don't know, okay, should I hire a lawyer to create the fundraising? How, how does it work? Should I, uh, how sh can I register my company? So all the structuring elements about the jurisdiction of the company, the tax components, all of those topics are extremely important because, you know, what we're building here is we're building, in a certain way, startups, but that have foundation, almost like an IPO company. So they have boards, they have processes, they have, you know, corporate governance, they have all the legal matters in place. Why? Because, you know, we want to show that once we go out in the markets, that the investor, we actually realize, okay, wait a minute, those guys are very structured, you know? Doesn't look like, you know, a startup. This company look like already have done a few rounds because, you know, what we're doing internally, we are doing this institutionalization work with data room and stuff. We're actually, you know, we're presenting company to the market that are in a certain way almost look like they're VC backed because we are inside the company. So yeah, I think those are the major elements. Yeah, and I think uh, also on the especially on the team side, team side, the, the fact that you know we are we are fortunate enough to have you know sort of fifty plus employees. They span all across you know U.S., Europe, uh, Middle East, and and so forth. So we are fortunate enough again to to utilize the internal workforce, whether it's legal, finance, uh, project management, or even technical like so, such as DevOps roles. Uh, and so so forth, because there is there is plenty of you know firepower internally, so we can always fall back on that, use that, and that helps the company you know get off its feet quicker as well. But in the same time, institute institutionalize the whole process as well. So um, I I think you know that is one of the key elements that is obviously a distinct value add, because because there might be a case where one person you know within Lian is solely responsible working as operator at one of the companies. Um, and he'll see you through the whole lifespan of the company. So um, I think that is one extreme value from from the company itself. It seems that like you had the big fund, but now you are you are doing like small, uh, relatively small investments. Do you think that there is a way to have a big fund and assets under management, and at the same time create many startups? Like, are you trying to find this? This model, because I, I understand that like building companies from scratch, it takes a lot of time and and little capital, and this is why like you can have higher returns. But still, like, is it is this model scalable or not? Uh, what do you think about scalability? Yeah, my personal view, unfortunately, <laughs> is that you know you have a kind of counterbalance. You know, as you say, assuming that you know we say okay. Robin, let's, or Max, let's build a venture fund studio. We will raise, I don't know, 100, 200 million, okay? So, you know, with 100, 200 million, you can easily create 20, 40 companies. Easily, you know? But the problem is that, you know, the timing that is required to create 20 companies in terms of team, employee, if you want to do it well, it's massive. And, you know, if you charge a 2% management fee, which is $2 million, you cannot pay even maybe a team of four or five companies. So, you know, like the amount of work which is required to, you know, to deploy capital, it's very, it's very hard. However, what, what I think is coming up, our model, which is very exciting, is that, you know, at the end of the day, let's say, for example, COA, now we're around in the markets for 100, 150 million equity rounds, okay? So, you know, we will not use the, you know, venture studio approach because, you know, we're going to see external investors. But, you know, eventually those companies that we're creating might raise $100 million. Now, you might also have a model where actually you're kind of a follow-on fund where basically, you know, you say, okay, you know, I have maybe a 20 million venture funds, but then, you know, on the other side, in parallel, I have a more traditional VC structure with 200 million that is going just to follow on the rounds of the successful company I built into the studio. So that's in my view, but you know, this funds is not operator, you know, it's just, you know, purely investors, management fee, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very easy job to do. So maybe the two structures can work in parallel, but you know, in my view, it's very hard to have a large size, one billion, whatever venture builder found, because you know, it's just, you know, time consuming and uh, it is not scalable on that respect. Did you consider a model of private equity to buy companies and then rebuild those companies with your team? And what do you think about also comparison between venture builders and private equity? Maybe it's 
also ability to operate with bigger companies and save time to, to build those companies. Yeah, that's actually a, a very massive value proposition because we have done it, uh, you know, with one company. Actually, what, what's the idea? It's very simple. So again, uh, we discussed about Cheese, which is our dental business network, okay? So we invested more than one year and a half into the establishment of the business. Why? Because, you know, we have no idea about who are the, dent- the supply chain, the dentists. We have no idea what are the legal requirements. We don't about nothing. We need to build the brand. So, and then, you know, what we're doing on this business is that we're only doing acquisition. So instead of creating new clinics, we just acquire new clinics, digital items. And now what we say is that, wait a minute, we basically wasted two years of time and three, four million dollars of market research of, you know, building a brand, trying to hire the team, et cetera, et cetera. We're basically what we would have done, we're going to take the four million dollars, buy an existing business, rebranding, keeping the team, you know, or, or, or adjusting a bit and being fast from day one. So, for example, this I call it a little bit like a buy mid approach uh, rather than you know private equity. And and now we're considering doing this in another sector. The idea would be very simple. We realize that you know it's way faster to buy businesses, you know, not mandatory under value, whatever, to buy an existing platform, I would say, which has already an existing team, which we believe is solid, and then leverage from the team to scale up faster. That would save two years of time. And you know, I would say a lot of work of trial and error because, you know, you are buying knowledge, you know, when, when you're buying those companies, you're buying two years of market research and knowledge and, and experience from scratch. So, you know, it's a, absolutely a very massive value proposition and we are starting to implement that on some businesses. Obviously, I would say it's, it's, it's more easy to do it with, let's say, concrete businesses. It's a, it's more difficult things. Let's say, say, I want to buy a blockchain company, you know, because eventually, you know, it's it's more, you know, it might be a lot of intangible asset, a lot of IP. But, you know, let's say, you know, now we, we want to launch a, a business of buying deals in the longevity sector. So, you know, instead of trying to understand, okay, what are the treatment in the clinic, we just buy uh, three, four clinics, we rebrand them, and we start it from scratch. I think it's faster. So you will combine both approaches, uh, yeah. a private equity plus, plus venture building. Yeah. Uh-huh. What do you think were the main challenges and, and problems with the fund or venture venture builder? Can you remember your biggest challenges creating companies in parallel or investing in parallel? I think one of the you know key highlights when you when you're starting out the company is obviously the the team. Uh, that that's the key pillar. Like that's that's your foundation. That's what you're going to build upon, and that's your kind of you know uh, northern star per se. Um, and, and looking back at the previous experience that we had, onboarding a, a person to the team that has been at a huge corporation with 5,000 plus employees, such as, you know, Meta, Amazon, Google, whatever it might be, right? Where they are in their own silo and they are just, you know, working with few people. You really cannot bring those people in. Uh, you know, this is not generalizing, but in, in most cases, right? You cannot bring those people in at the first stage because they're just not used to the, to the structure. What we really like and what we've seen, uh, I call it uh, everybody at the first first kind of days of the company, first months, first year, uh, everybody's a jack of all trades. Uh, everybody does, you know, uh, some bits here and there. You just have to be flexible, right? You have to you have to manage that. You have to understand how you work together. Uh, obviously, there are you know internal sort of uh, productivity stack that we use and utilize to to sort of capitalize on that. But you know. Bringing in relevant people and, and understanding the kind of entrepreneurial spirit, spirit is absolutely key. Uh, I, I think from that point, that standpoint, I think that is one of the key pillars. And I think you know the second item that immediately um, sort of pops to mind is you essentially are not in a hurry to go out there and fundraise immediately and, and get the company off the ground. You know, in, in some cases we've seen with BC companies where they just want to mark the valuation, you know, quickly get the round going as soon as the first one ended. I, I think, you know, we really try to direct the team focus as well as the CEO's focus on actually running the company and not worry about the whole fundraise uh, process whatsoever. I think that's, you know, part of what Liam brings. And they are pure operators. They just focus entirely on that. And that avoids so many mistakes. You know, we, we, we saw in 2021 where companies raised at 50x 
ARR, you know, that's going to take them uh, nine years, uh, growing 20% year on year in order to grow to its current valuation, you know, assuming a 10x multiple. So you just see the scale, like you, you, you're not there for the cash grab, uh, per se. So yeah, for no, absolutely. I think, you know, there are two points which are, which I think we learned from the mistake. Uh, one is the scalability. Uh, so, you know, sometimes when you are thinking about solution or something, you don't think about what can be wrong on the scalability side. Um, you know, everything looks very easy and, you know, like we have recently the, uh, an example with the company which we launched into the gaming sector, uh, where actually what we're doing is we're gamifying the experience within sports fan and uh, athletes. And, uh, you know, when we built out the first proof of concept, the tech stack, etc., etc., everything was smooth. The day of the launch, we, we got two, 300,000 downloads and the whole thing crashed, you know? And so we basically had to invest six months of rebuilding the product behind to allow, you know, a better product. So, you know, sometimes it's be the West, you know, I think a little bit undervalued and supply chain issue as well. We also had launched a business in the food tech space that eventually was very good as a proof of concept, very good to serve, you know, 1,000, 2,000 units of products. But then if you want to scale up, you realize, oh my God, there's no supplier that can produce this amount of, of stuff. Oh my God, you know, I don't know, it takes six months. How can I do it to refill my products? So, you know, I think uh, eventually founders are underestimating the importance of testing scalability of their business at a later stage and also supply chain issues. And also another, I think, mistake is I was mentioning about this decision of corporate governance. What does it mean that, you know, most of the time, if it doesn't work, you need to cut, you know. Unfortunately, you know, we are always with the mindset, these things will change. You know, like oh, we have a girlfriend, you have some tension, and you say, okay, eventually, you know, she will change. That's fake. She'll never change. And the same things apply to the business. So unless you don't have a very drastic business model change, things will not improve just by staying the same. So, you know, we need to act fast decision. And fast decision means, okay, we stop doesn't work. Thank you very much. We enjoyed working together. You know, we'd love to continue working together, but this project doesn't work. Or, you know, second decision means we need to change completely the business model. This business model doesn't work. Can we pivot? If yes, we continue. If not, we don't. I see many previously mistakes, uh, again, about dragging months, every month. Okay, let's wait. Next month will be better. And, you know, I think what we learn is that also we need to be able to cut fast, you know, on decision and, and being able to to basically close companies fast as soon as we see that, you know, there is no market for that. You mentioned that you plan to attract founders in order to be able to launch many companies in parallel. So what are you looking for? You say second time founders who previously failed, but uh, how do you create this funnel of applications of potential founders and what you are looking for at, at those in those uh, founders? How do you choose them? The people we actually are attracting until today are basically in a certain way people that are inside our network, you know. Maybe uh, a colleague at uni, which was very successful, you know, then went, you know, into top tier firm, top tier banks, and, you know, after a few years in banks or whatever, is bored and say, look, I want to build my business. And, you know, we say, okay, what's your business about? We start conversation, we like it, and, you know, so, like, we don't have this process, okay, fill it the form online, we review your application, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I believe the best way uh, and, you know, uh, we're pushing internally is that actually our own team internally build companies. I think that's the most exciting things. We're actually, you know, those people internally say, okay, come with idea. Okay, by the way, guys, you know, I see what we're doing. I saw these markets. I would love to build a company inside. And why? Because, you know, again, as you're working together already in the company and organization, you already have the knowledge, you already know each other, you already know the processes, you already know who is doing what. So, you know, you have this probably three to six months of learning phase where actually you need to understand who is doing what to recover that are fast. And also, you know, I think there is already a level of trust because, you know, you're already in a working environment where you know each other and you have tested, you know, what does and, and, and does not work. So I think our plan is to push more and more internally, let's say growing companies from, you know, other people in the team that have ideas, share idea and want to take that direction. But, you know, eventually we're also thinking about structuring the process from an external perspective. 
uh, you know, but we need to make sure, you know, obviously how we assess those funders, as you say, what are the requirements of those funders, because, you know, we have done the things here a little bit like, I don't want to say a family, but let's say an, an internal team, where actually we never had any needs of going around and shopping for founders. But I think, you know, the secret in, in venture capital, and I think also this business is that, you know, you need to see as many ideas as possible, you know. So, you know, the more idea, the more companies you see, the more you have a chance to get successful. Exactly. And, you know, I think it's, it's key uh, for the sort of founder to have experience or have some sort of significance to the problem that, you know, he wants to solve. I think that is one of the key differentiations that you see uh, when assessing, you know, sort of successful founders and, and the ones that are not that successful. I think, you know, coming from the problem itself that they have tackled and, and seeing it through, uh, obviously, if he's a, you know, second time founder as well, that's, that's another tick in the box. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's in general what we see and what, what really sets the kind of stage apart. So if I understand right, you launched three companies, then you say that not all of your successful, probably two, uh, yeah. two of your unsuccessful. So you have three, three companies. How much money do you invest it in, in those three companies? And uh, if you have some IRR or I don't know, uh, yeah. some multiplicator, TVPI. So, so for this just year. let me clarify. Today we have five companies which are active. And we uh, have two which, uh, you know, in a certain way we, we, we closed uh, down. So in total it was seven. So I mean, in terms of, you know, I think those five companies of internal de deployed capitals, looking at the numbers more or less, I think we're close to $50 million. Uh, some of them, again, was three, four million. $50 million from yeah, yeah. your, I don't know, syndicate or fund? Yes, yes, or, exactly. For investors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, the majority of those companies are still in, uh, in a certain way in seed space. Uh, you know, in a, in a series A phase. Uh, the bigger one, as I say, we discuss is COA, where actually, you know, we are now doing our CSB. In terms of IRR, it's also, in a certain way, that's obviously a metric which goes with time. So I don't think it's very relevant because, you know, we are kind of scaling up those companies very fast. Imagine that COA, we launched, we were, I don't know, 2022 million revenues, 2021, already 40 million revenues, 2022, already 50 million revenues. So, you know, like, you know, the time lag sometimes might not be the best indicator. I would say cash on cash, maybe it's a more relevant multiple, you know, let's say multiple investing capital. I think, you know, we can certainly aim to, I would say, doing a, something between 5 to 10x cash on cash over the successful mm -hmm. businesses, over a duration that it might, be, it might be between 3 to 7 years, you know. That's our aim, you know. Uh, our aim is, I would say, to make a... In the best case scenario, 10x cash on cash over a five to seven years lifetime. That's mm. more or less. Because of acquisitions, acquisitions, right? Yeah. So yeah. about fund, what was uh, the initial size of fund uh, when you invested late stage? Yeah, we done 500 million, as you say, of deployed capital on that. Uh, on that yeah. 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 We have deployed large ticket, you know, in few concentrated uh -huh. companies. And the problem is that, you know, if you deploy a 50 or 100 million ticket in a company and the company, you know, goes a 50% down rounds, then, you know, mm. like, you know, if you look at the down rounds in the tech space, you basically have 80, 90% of the tech companies which raised in 2019 mm. in the sector mm. of agrotech, fintech, whatever, edtech, that today are 90% discount with respect to the secondary value. So, you know, I would say for sure, you know, let's say that, Eventually, we've done mistakes because, you know, we were part of that pump as well. But, you know, let's say we always co-invest with top tier investors like SoftBank, you know, Google, Sequoia. Sequoia. But eventually, you know, those guys, they have 20 funds, you know, they have, you know, I mean, 200 yeah. companies. And so, you know, they can inflate. Like for us, having done very concentrated investments, it was obviously mm -hmm. in a certain way a potential high return because, you know, if that concentrated investment would have Pumped, you know. So, so those are pretty, pretty big on, on that scale. And as Ferenzo said, we're, we're kind of built on two pillars. First was the direct investment, you know, sort of 500 million deployed and, and ideally looking for anything on 3x or cash on cash. And then there's the completely separate department, which is the venture studio, where we, where we kind of bootstrap those. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm.
what must be track record before this raising raising big fund to to launch such a big fund so like what is how is it possible a personal track record uh, of you as an entrepreneur, so and your you know CV, your knowledge, but also obviously is matter of relationship, is matter mm-hmm. of being able to raise capital, and you know being able you know to to justify all of that. And, you know, again, I think it's also about thematic. You know, so if you're a very good strong thematic, for example, you know obviously today the very exciting thematic is obviously energy transition, AI, all those things. So you know, mm-hmm. if you're in the good teams at the right time. You know, like look at those AI startups. You know, you have some AI startups that raise 500 million. What's the track record? They exist in six months. You know, like without making names, there are a few AI startups that, you know, were created in June 2020, 2023, six months ago from zero. Now, recent valuation is already 2.5 billion. So, you know, mm-hmm. what's the track record? The same. You know, you're in good time where actually capital wants to deploy in that sector. You have the top keywords. And uh, eventually, you know, the risk is that, you know, you attract a lot of capital, but, you know, Eventually, there is a market. Same stuff, you know, which happened always in the crypto markets. You know, I remember in 2017, you had literally a project where they have a website and not even a, a white paper, no team, and they were raising $1,500 million without a website, you know? And you're saying, why? There's yeah, no track yeah. record, you know? It's just because, you know, it's, uh, it's a matter of being in a good mm. sector and, you know, kind of having a great story. Uh, so, mm. so that's, that's you know... <laughs> It is the first, uh, the first fund, so you you have yeah. right. right. So. Yeah, yeah. Again, the idea is that you know we always said um, on the structural side it's a little bit different from the funds. We always said raise individual capital on companies. So we never we didn't have uh, um, a five, yeah five hundred million compartment with capital inside. What we had is that okay, we had these five ten companies where we want to invest fifty million in each company, and then you know you go to CLPs. You like this, 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 this. So globally, we have deployed that amount, but it was not a, a traditional fund structure. It was always mm. in our mindset to have this deal by deal approach. You had uh, like a VC usual usual fund, yeah. but you did a deal by deal, yeah. Yeah, but it's always structured this by deal because you know, as you say, we realize that it's very hard to structure as a fund. First time found, you cannot raise half a billion dollar. Yeah, it, yeah. This is why it's because this is you know, why. like. Uh, the investor, we want to see the targets. But, you know, if you structure this, as I mentioned to you, as a pipeline of deals, we we'll say, okay, these companies, you want to invest in this one, this one, or this one, then, you know, maybe the 50 million that would have go inside the fund, they go directly into companies. You don't care, you know, eventually, because eventually you deploy the capital. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we have, uh, the capital we deployed has always been done through specific club deals. Uh, mm-hmm. Without you know a, a structure as a fund, you know. Do you have some sort of syndicate where you create a SPV yeah. and uh, attract investors? And so this is what we, you, you were doing with uh, Lian Group from 2017, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So we have Luxembourg uh, dedicated compartments for each transaction. We have mm. new compartments in place with full different sources of capital. And we're actually, again, those sources of capital are only segregated inside that investment. Tell me a bit about, about this like fundraising process. Like, what did you do? Like, who are the investors? Uh, like, what yeah. is architecture of investors or institutionals or family offices? How, yeah. how does it work? Well, the investor is basically simple. Uh, Obviously, you know, uh, the advantage is, is that, you know, we're very close with and successful entrepreneurs, so former founders. So those mm-hmm. guys, again, as I mentioned, they don't want to invest in a portfolio, liquid portfolio. They want to deal. So, you know, I see it's a mix of, let's say, former founder, successful founder, ultra network individual, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, you have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to work with a few small, medium-sized banks that, you know, are not the large banks that obviously have restriction mm-hmm. about, you know, a type of vehicle, but, you know, more kind of entrepreneurial banks that, you know, we say, okay, you know, I like this transaction, 5 million, I can commit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's a mix between, I would say, ultra network, family office, and mid small institutional investors. So we didn't have any large uh, scale organization. Its majority was, you know, I would say 50-50 between institutional investors, small mid-size and uh, private clients. 
It's great. So if you can create some masterclass on fundraising, I think because it's it's huge <laughs> track record. Be invested. So five hundred plus fifty million through yeah. through your club into into startups. So it's like five hundred fifty million. If I write this is this figure right? Yeah, five hundred fifty million invested in uh, late stage deals plus actually like startups created in interesting. Yeah. Do you call your, yourself a venture studio? I think uh, we should call ourselves venture studio. I don't like the word venture by itself because you uh, know I think it's too much restrictive. As you know, as I told you, we are also doing some acquisition now, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I think maybe, you know, we should create, you should tell us maybe <laughs> what would be the best for maybe enter- the expert. <laughs> entrepreneurial studio, I don't know, corporate studio, I don't know. Like venture may be too much... Uh, uh, Tech oriented, you know. Let's say, you know, we, we are trying to to figure out what's the best uh, words, you know. Yeah, there, there should be some some new word like yes, uh, EVC studio, uh, yes. private equity capital studio. Yeah, maybe, like. maybe, <laughs> maybe, why not? <laughs> Hybrid, Hybrid. Yeah, Hybrid. Yeah, <laughs> studio. Maybe I work. Yeah, venture mix studio. <laughs> what is your strategy? So, in what strategy do you believe? most because you try different approaches investing in late stage companies building from scratch and and um, buying companies uh and like scaling them uh so what what approach do you believe now and and you are doing this agnostic not only agnostic but like different yeah. stages of investments yeah. so what what is the model you believe uh is is great to develop i think you know um it's it's funny but you know in the ideal world, you know what actually it's our vision. It's eventually to to have an idea of a holding company. You know, I don't want to say Berkshire Hathaway idea, but you know, eventually imagine it not as a fund, not as a you know, imagine it as an holding company, where you know mm-hmm. eventually what you're doing is that you know as soon as there is an exit, wherever of a portfolio company, you are getting upside this capital into the holding company as dividend, and then with this capital. You can do other stuff. You can create new companies and become like a multiplicator effect. So, you know, my view, I mean, what we're trying to achieve is to stop. You know, eventually, you know, what, what's our strategy is that, you know, as we're growing, as we're getting exit, we need to invest this capital. And, you know, in my view, there's a way, a great approach where actually this capital can invest in either in existing business through going to existing business or actually creating new businesses. And eventually, you know, you can take this holding and can be in the public market. So, you know, the last piece of the puzzle that, you you know, we, we don't cover. But, you know, eventually, you know, if you create a public companies where actually it's a venture studio in reality, where, you know, you might say to your public market, guys, look, guys, this is basically your exposure to a liquid stock, to a public market stock, but in reality, which has private vehicles and, you know, let's say venture capital assets downstairs, diversified across different sectors, across different stages. I think that's, you know, something that might make sense as an investment proposition to reach the institutional investor. Because, you know, eventually what you're saying is that, you know, if you want to scale up the business in terms of size and volume, you need to reach institutional investor. So if you have a public stock, then you're matching the cases of many institutional investors that need the liquidity, et cetera, et cetera, which you cannot provide them with your private companies. So eventually our, in my view, our last, uh, let's say, gain uh, in the puzzle would be, you know, as we're scaling, uh, as we're exiting, you know, to structure this as a, you know, a public investment vehicle where actually, you know, there will be an exposure to a diversified set of venture businesses. So bank. No, oh, no, no not bank. Merchant bank, maybe. <laughs> yeah, great. Great. Thank you, Robin, Fiorenza. Thank uh, you, Max. One more puzzle into new... Uh, different venture studio models because uh, it's interesting that when I meet people, usually there is no some typical venture studio yeah. and everyone suggests some new model approach and like uh, innovates. So probably the most innovative entrepreneurs are partners of, of studios. <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs>